Um, just want to welcome everybody. Before we do, I think this person needs to be honored. You know I'm talking about you, Jennifer. Jennifer Humes was picked as the St. Clair County Teacher of the Month. <laughs> she teaches my little grandson, and I asked him, how is Mrs. Humes as a teacher? He, she, he went, man, she's all right. <laughs> <laughs> No, he just loves her to death. Just a couple things. And we have a birthday. We had a birthday this week, did we not? 99. 99 years old. Happy birthday. 99. <laughs> so, don't forget, let's remind everybody that next Sunday, spring forward. So we're going to lose an hour out there somewhere, somehow. So that starts next Sunday. So, also don't forget downstairs after the service we do have a Sunday school class going on. Wednesday night we're continuing our talk about God's grace and again it's just a, a great group of people just with great ideas. It's just a great class. If you can make that 630 you're all invited. At 6.30, we have kick on Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, our youth, as you can see, most of our youth's not here. They're at Statewide having a, a wonderful time. Pray that they get back safely to us today. Also, Bob mentioned, we are going to continue our buck stop. If you notice, the van's not out there because you took the van to Statewide. And so besides you giving that you give, any additional dollar change, please put it in the box so we can pay for that. We've been doing a series here, and this is the last of the series of Thy Kingdom Come. And this is our goal for 2019. And we talked about it, that we're going to forget what lies behind, and we're going to strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize, the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. And so, again, what's our objective? Upon this rock, I will build my church. And so today's, as you can see, we're all excited here today. Our sermon today is surprise. I was going to say it three times, surprise, surprise, surprise. See how many people remember Gomer Pyle. But again, if you would please get your Bibles and we're going to be in Acts chapter 10. And as we get into Acts chapter 10, this is a pivotal chapter in scripture. If we just look back and we've been studying the first few books of the book of Acts. And we can really see how you cannot put God in a box. All of a sudden, Jesus ascends, and the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples. They think, this is so great. Look what we have. It's our job to spread the word. And so now, during the day of Pentecost, they think, well, we'll probably get a few people to accept Jesus Christ. 3,000 accepted Jesus Christ. Within weeks, 5,000 people people and they were so excited and then it got to a point where how are we going to feed because nobody wanted to leave Jerusalem and people were so giving and caring these Jews here were just helping everybody and then we see where now the gospel is going to spread and in chapter 10 we're going to see the story of Cornelius and Peter and it's going to be after this event at Cornelius' house that the church will explode with growth and numerous churches are going to grow worldwide. And this is such a pivotal thing that we need to look at. So now I've done my research on some things and for a long time I didn't believe that the publishing clearinghouse sweepstakes was true. I did some research and yes it is. People got those big checks. <laughs> and the good news is that it is legitimate. The bad news, it's really, really hard to win any of those prizes. I know my mother for years has said, your inheritance is when that check comes in <laughs> from publishing Clearinghouse. And so, yes, and it's been years and we're waiting. But the giveaways are so famous and so many people enter them that the odds of winning are unbelievable. They used to give a 10 million giveaway. I think they stopped that in 2008. And he said the odds were 10 times worse than the odds of hitting the Powerball. Now, the advantage is, with Publishing Clearinghouse, is you don't have to gamble anything. You just have to simply sign up. And who knows, maybe you could be the one that they knock on your door 
and gave you this prize. And we're going to talk about this surprise. I remember a very, very good friend of mine I played basketball with, his dad, at the time I think it was 79 or 80, received a card in the mail that he had an opportunity to go to Tiger Stadium and win a card. There's a key waiting for him there. And of course, he said, no, this is one of those scams. You call the dealership, whatever. So my friend checked in on it, and it was legit. And so he said, come to the Tiger game. So he goes to the Tiger game, and I think there was 10 people who were picked. And so they, the, the place is packed. 10 people came down to the field. And there was a brand new car sitting in the infield. And they handed each one an envelope with a key in it. You had to open up the envelope, go see if the, car, the key would unlock the door. Well, they go, on your mark, get set, go. Well, my friend's dad couldn't get his envelope open. And as he's trying to get the envelope, everybody else has. And so the first person doesn't work. Second person doesn't work. And it goes all through everybody, and none of their keys don't work. So now everybody knows that he's won the car. He doesn't know. The place is just erupting as he finally gets up. And he looks and sees, puts the key in, it opens the door. Here's an 80-year-old man now running the bases at Tiger Stadium, <laughs> all geeked that he won this car. And that is a true story. Now, he was surprised, and he won because, again, my friend told him, Dad, this is legit, because he wasn't going to go to the game, and it was a good thing that he did. Now, also, we got to look that sometimes surprises can upset you as well. Nothing like a little letter from the IRS just to make your day. For some of you who are a little older, there was nothing, as my dad always said, back in 1950, he got that letter. Congratulations, you are a Marine. <laughs> I remember one time at, when I was running a youth program at the church in Florida, and we had a, uh, a fundraiser, and everybody got a ticket, and we had all these prizes you could win. And so after I had given all the prizes, I drew one more ticket. Because I was going to say, now you can go tell your friends that you are one ticket away from the grand prize. Well, there was one <laughs> elderly woman that went to our church that just seemed to always get up on the wrong side of the bed. Always kind of finding fault with her. And whose number did I pick? Hers. Oh, she, and, and that was the first time I've ever seen her excited. I won, I won. I said, well, not necessarily. <laughs> That didn't go over very well, <laughs> and she was extremely. So keep that thought as we continue today. Now, this is the last of our series, as I said, Thy Kingdom Come. And we looked at the first few chapters of Acts, again, as a perspective of Jesus' promise about, upon this rock, I will build this church. Now, I'm sure that the early Christians did many things that helped the church grow. But each chapter we've studied in the book of Acts, we see that it was Jesus that was building his church, his church. And we looked at his power and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to go back here and look at Acts 10 for a minute. Because now the church had been in existence for about three to four years now. And it was growing tremendously. But up to this point, up until chapter 10, up until this Point, you could count on one thing. Every Christian in the church was Jewish. That meant that every man who believed and was baptized was a circumcised believer. Now, I prayed this morning and I'm praying now. I hope I don't have to explain circumcision to everybody, anybody here. I do have a slideshow. <laughs> no, we're just playing. <laughs> And so, let's continue on here. So every new Christian, every man in the church up until this point was a circumcised Jew. That's just how things were done up until now, up until chapter 10. Now here God is going to switch gears on us. God's plan has always been to open the gates, to open the gates for Gentiles to become Christians. And now... It was time to put that plan into motion. Now you have thought that if God wanted to do something like that, it would have been just very easy to do. We're talking about God. I mean, after all, this is what he does. 
We don't put God in a box. How easy would this be for him? But there's a little problem with this because the Jews despised the Gentiles. They wanted nothing to do with these people. They referred to them as dogs, which is not an affectionate term. It was an insult. They wouldn't sit down and eat with them. They wouldn't spend the night in their homes. They would not buy anything unless they had to. And if they did, they took it home and they made sure it was scrubbed clean. Now, just calling them Gentile dogs wasn't enough. The worst insult that a Jewish person could call somebody else was uncircumcised. That was the ultimate insult. Now, that's just the way things are. Now, God was going to ask the early church here in chapter 10, again, which was made up of good Christian Jews, is we're going to allow these uncircumcised Gentile dogs to be part of the church, his church. It's not going to be an easy sell. So how is God going to do this? How is God? Because God works in so many wonderful, cool ways. He's got to sell this idea to the Jewish believers. Well, first of all, he has to choose a man who everybody liked to be in this test case. It's got to be important. God knows exactly what he's doing. And so he picks a man named Cornelius, a prominent leader in the Roman army who wasn't Jewish. And scripture tells us that he, this is Cornelius, and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. So you got this good guy out there. He's Roman. Now, you got to like a guy like this. Plus, he was probably big and strong and carried a weapon that you had to be very careful what you said to a guy like this. Now, then God... He found this Gentile. God had to find the right man to preach the first message to the Gentiles. And do you know who he chose? Probably the most stubborn, mule-headed, obstinate measure, messenger that he could ever find. And who was that? Peter. Why Peter? Because you know if there was anyone who was going to fight to keep the Gentiles out of the church, it was going to be Peter. He would have said, no way, it's not going to happen, it's not supposed to, unless they follow some sort of protocol or some kind of our traditions. In fact, Peter was so hard to convince that three times God had to give him a vision. And it was a vision of this sheet filled with these, all these different kind of animals and said, eat of these. And he said, I can't. They're unclean. I've been taught we can't eat these things. And again, three times, and each time, God said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Now, if God has shown you something three times, it's got to be important, and you better listen to him. And so when Peter goes now to Cornelius' house, I love what he says, first thing he says before he even talks to him, before the sermon starts, and he says, you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. He's saying, I'm coming in here, I just want you all to know that I'm breaking the law. That there's going to be a lot of people upset, but I'm here, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure, don't call anybody unclean, so when I was sent for, for, I came without raising any objection. I'm here. Now, what's also interesting is he didn't come by himself. He brought some of his circumcised buddies with him just to tag along, just to make sure. I'm not going to do this alone, fellas. Come on. And when they got to Cornelius' house, and when he began to preach to these people the word of God and tell them about Jesus and what Jesus had done for them, and he was just getting warmed up. He was ready to lay it on these people because he was fired. All of a sudden, something happened. The entire room erupts. And the Gentiles began to praise God and speak in tongues. 
Peter's friends were shocked. What is going on here? Peter himself probably was a bit amazed at what was going on. What is happening here? And Peter recovers very quickly. And he asks, can anyone stand in the way of their being baptized with water? And what does he do? He baptizes them. And really, that's pretty much the story of Acts chapter 10. But I want to go into it a little deeper. Because I find there are three groups of people who are surprised at what God did. First, there was Peter. I mean, Peter was surprised. He was surprised that God is willing to have him preach to the Gentiles. He was shocked. Oh my, you want me to do what? Then he was surprised by how all of a sudden the crowd suddenly erupts in praises and speaking in tongues. But he gets over surprised because he takes all these people and says, I guess this is what I'm supposed to do, and he goes and baptizes them. Now the second group was Peter's friends. They too, as we read in Acts 10, the circumcised believers who had came with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on these Gentiles. Hmm. And then the third group, the folks back in Jerusalem, the good, solid Christian Jews, they're surprised. Not only were they shocked, that these uncircumcised Gentiles were allowed to be baptized, but they were also upset that Peter would even have the audacity to go into their house and eat with these uncircumcised dogs, as they call them. Not only were they really not surprised, these boys were furious at what Peter did as we see in Acts 11. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of the uncircumcised men and ate with them? It wasn't even about baptizing. They go, you went in their house? They are more upset that he went into their house. They pitched a fit because they were surprised. Because this wasn't normal. This wasn't something you expect. And this was not acceptable to these men. Now let's go back to our opening illustration here. Why was this woman all excited? I mean, she got a check. She didn't expect a check. It wasn't normal for somebody, and she was at work at the time. And somebody told her, I think there's something wrong with your car. Can you go check it? Which was normal. She said, I had an old junker car, and there's always leaking something. And so it was just a normal thing for her to walk out of her office, go down to a car, and as she goes down there, there they are, whistles blowing, confetti, and she's handed this check. Now, she didn't expect a $10,000 check. If you could expect that someone would give you a huge check when you stepped out into the parking lot here, say, just when you go out there, there's going to be people waiting. There's going to be somebody going to hand out a $10,000 check. I'd already be out there. <laughs> but nobody really expects that sort of thing ever to happen. Thus, this woman was surprised because this was not what she expected. Now, if you remember last Sunday, we talked about Philip. And I didn't get into it because there's a real oddity here. A couple people mentioned it to me as they're, they're leaving a little bit. But we know we talked about how Philip went into Samaria. And for a lot of people, well, that's just the next country up. What's so big about that? That's just a pretty cool thing. Well, let's jog your memory here a little bit. I don't know if you remember the story of the Good Samaritan and how Jesus, it all started when Jesus said, how you need to love your neighbor. And somebody said, well, who's your neighbor? And he said, I got a story for you. How this Jewish man was traveling and how he got beat up and was left for dead. And how all of a sudden here comes a high official of the Jewish people. Looked at him, went to the other side of Rome, kept going. Then a Jewish priest saw this fellow Jew laying there near dead, almost stepped over him and kept on going. And then Jesus, and then a Samaritan came and everybody, I could just see the, whoa, 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 where are you going with this one? And you're saying, why did the Jews hate the Samaritans? Well, I'll tell you. Because the Samaritans were not Jews in their eyes. Samaritans were half-breeds. 
where either their father or mother were Jewish and they married outside the faith. And that was a no-no. You know, teaching in Florida, we had a pretty large Jewish population. And a lot of times I'd see a young girl in my class dating somebody and I'm going, oh, I don't think he's Jewish. And she's, oh, he's not. And I'm going, well, I'm telling you, I'm calling your mother. And, she, uh, and then I go, I'm calling your grandmother. Oh, no, 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 don't do that. And so even today, it's still a big thing. And so here, it is a big thing to them. Now, they knew that these Samaritans, if you were Jewish, they were not welcomed in their homes. And more importantly, they were not welcomed in their temple. Now, but apparently, they were circumcised. And how do we know that? Because nobody back in Jerusalem pitched a fit about it. When they were baptized, nobody said anything. Nobody said, oh, how could you do that? Basically, they weren't surprised. Okay, we can see this. They're circumcised people. They were part of the Jewish faith or whatever. We're not happy that they're happy, but we're okay because they were circumcised that they can now be baptized. So we're okay with that. And what I also found interesting in chapter 8 is when Peter and John came down from Jerusalem up to Samaria, and with these new believers, they laid the whole, their hands on them so they could get the gift of this Holy Spirit. And we notice here that they did this. And they weren't surprised about what was happening to these people. Why wouldn't they be surprised? Well, they've been doing this. This is what these guys did. It was normal for them to go in the laying of hands. Now, if you also remember, Philip, who was the man who went there and preached the word of God, and did all kinds of healings and miracles. He did not have the power of laying of hands. And we talked about that. Now, Peter and John could because they were apostles. In fact, the only people who are recorded as being able to do this were apostles that could lay on hands and give these people the power. They could, even Paul could, as we read in 2 Timothy. For this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift, charisma of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, just a review here. The word charismata means, charis means great, mata means the result of. Charismata means the result of the grace that is in us. Charismata were gifts that were the result of the Spirit's work in the, the believer. Now, we also got to understand, we explained this last Sunday. Acts 2.3 tells us when we repent and are better, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But Charismata were gifts given by the Holy Spirit. It was already there. And now with the laying of hands, this new Spirit, now you can... do these things. And it had to be done by an apostle. God gave us the Spirit when people were saved, and then the Spirit gave gifts to strengthen the church. So, for these early Christian Jews, there was a protocol. There was a way that you did this to become a Christian. First of all, every new male was someone who had already been circumcised. If you were going to be a Christian, you had to be circumcised. You had to be willing to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, say that you're a sinner, confess of your sins, get baptized in the water, grave of baptism, and come up. And if you were willing to that, do that, you were doing the right thing. And then the third thing is, then maybe an apostle would impart special gifts by the laying of hands on you. And so this is what they thought. Now, these things were expected to happen. This is what the early church thought. This is how it's supposed to be. Why wouldn't it be this way? It made sense to them. And then this happens. They never expected what happened when Peter went to Cornelius' house. This is what's going to blow their minds. Because what God did here changed everything. Now here comes that big surprise. And the missing part now of these that's going to throw this all out of whack is that Cornelius and his friends were not circumcised. It's 
interesting that this is the only place in the New Testament that we hear about Christians being referred to as believers who were circumcised. This is the only place, as you're going to see in Acts 11, nowhere else, just here. Peter's friends, and later, as we see, were called this. But why is it only here? Why just here, and why nowhere else? That phrase never will occur anywhere else in the Bible. Because God was making a point. Peter's friends, again, the circumcised party, were labeled the believers who were circumcised. Why call them that? Because of these men, you got to understand, and I can see this, because now we're going to see God's got to take over. And so here's these guys, and he's going, hey, you got to come with me. I'm going to this Gentile's house. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm told to spread the word, and I can see in the friend's mind, he said, I'm going to need help, because in their mind, in order to become a Christian, you had to be circumcised if there are going to be men there. And so, come on, fellas, you need to come with me, because before we dunk them, we got to cut them. And they're willing to do this. Okay, let's do this. Now, God now takes over. God had no intentions of letting these Gentiles become circumcised. That was the old covenant. That was the old law. If you remember again, when Abraham was called the father of Israel, that the sign was going to be that each Jewish male will be served. That will be a sign that you are a Hebrew. Now, this is going to be changed. Because now, God is stepping in. Now, the mark of belonging to God is going to be baptism. Colossians 2 tells us, In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was not put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. In other words, baptism is a new circumcision. In addition... God was doing something here in Acts 10 that he did, hadn't done since the day of Pentecost. As Peter was speaking in Jerusalem later, it says, As I begin to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Notice, it wasn't since the beginning. He said, at the beginning. What had occurred here in Cornelius' house with the Spirit coming down upon these Gentiles had happened since the day of Pentecost. But it happened now because God wanted to make a point about the Gentiles becoming Christians without being required to be circumcised. Now, Peter and his friends were a little confused because this is an important thing. This is huge. And we look back and say, I don't see what the big thing about. To them, this was huge because they expected they have this protocol, and now God has changed this. And seeing this, because again, they were ready to do these things, and I can see them, as all of a sudden the Spirit came upon these Gentiles and all these things, and Peter's, these guys go, well, I think we need, you know, they probably get, we got to, they want to get baptized, what, what, we, we got to get these prepared. He says, no. He said, can anyone stand in the way of their being baptized with water who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? A new time has come. A new time has come. So why ask that question? Because Peter's friends were still thinking about withholding baptism from these people because of a tradition from the Old Covenant. And basically, that's the story of Acts 10. But I want to look. How does this story apply to us? I once read a sign that said, once you've experienced the awesomeness of God, you begin to expect it. And I kind of liked it. I looked at it and said, that's not a bad thing, but, and it's true up to a point. If you see God do a lot of cool stuff in your life, I don't know if you really start expecting it. Sometimes you do. You just, man, I, I put it in God's hands, and that's pretty cool. But I have to admit, when I see God's power displayed, 
And I've seen it so many times in so many different ways. I get geeked. I get so geeked by just smiling. Yep, that's my God. <laughs> yep. Boom. Look what he can do. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, after all, if God's miracles happened every day, just rampant, 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 there are certain ones, but if all of a sudden, I guess we wouldn't call them miracles anymore, we just call them normals <laughs> or regulars. Well, God did a regular. <laughs> no, they're miracles. But miracles surprise us because they're not what we expect. That's what the miracle, things that happen that we don't expect. Now, there's nothing wrong with being surprised when God does something wonderful for us in our lives, something dramatic for us in our lives. However, it's what we do next that can make all the difference. In our story today, we have three groups of people who are extremely surprised. And they're surprised again. We have the first group, the people in Jerusalem, who were surprised that the Gentiles even became Christians. And their surprise led them to be angry because God didn't consult with them first. God hadn't done what they thought should be done. And so they got mad and they pitched a fit. And they became so determined to fight what was happening, that this was changing everything they believed in, that it actually ended up creating one of the first splits in the church. Now, in case you didn't realize it, splitting the church is not a good thing. It's not a good thing to hurt the church. It's not a good thing to get angry. It's not a good thing to demand your way in God's church. So I love about this congregation. Because if there's a problem, you seek advice. If there's a problem, we seek the scriptures. If there's a problem, we want to make sure that we're not doing anything unscriptural. Because where the Bible speaks, we speak. And we're silent. We're silent. But that's what happens when people in churches don't get their way. Or they become offended by something that upsets them. They get angry. They end up hurting the church because they didn't get what they wanted. That was the first group. The second group of people were surprised were the six friends of Jesus. They were so surprised by what they saw taking place. Right in front of their eyes, they literally didn't seem to know what they should do about it. What do we do? We're seeing it. We're not hearing. Those people heard about it. They had time to think they got mad. These people, they were just surprised. They basically got paralyzed into non-action. They weren't sure what to do, and they basically ended up almost doing nothing. And there are a lot of Christians out there who are like that. They're surprised by what they hear out of Scripture. They're surprised by what they read about God's power and what they hear about what God has promised them. They just don't know quite what to do. What paralyzes them is not that they're not certain God would actually do stuff like that for them. They're not sure, basically that God that they read in scriptures is even real in their lives. I read about it, but am I even sure that God's going to come into my life? Am I really sure if I give everything I have, if I just do what God asked me, that he's going to change my life? This is what shocked these people. This is the surprise. They didn't know what to do. And for some of them, they'll go through the motions. Oh, they'll show up. They'll sing songs. They'll pray. They'll put money in the offering. They'll listen. And then they just go home. Because there's nothing here to see, folks. So they just move along, never seeming to believe or expect that God could do anything in their lives. And that's when it becomes sad. Because they're missing out on so many blessings that Jesus Christ wants to give us. And then there's a the third group. Like Peter. Peter was surprised by the dreams that God had given him. And he was surprised that God had him go to this Gentile's house. But Peter had seen the awesomeness of God before. He's seen what God can do. And once he realized that God was in it, Peter was all for it. That's all he needed to know. God is in it. I'm for it. Whatever God leads us, then I'm fine with that. Now, as we wrap up this today... And as I call the singers up, I was always have, I always like a nice little story. You know that. I throw a little story in at the end or whatever. But I don't have one today. But I do have a question for us today. Which of these three groups of people are you like? Are you like the first group? 
those, un, those circumcised believers who stayed in Jerusalem, who threw a hissy fit just because God didn't do the things that they thought he should do? Are you like Peter's friends? You know about God's power, but you're not sure God will do anything like this in your life. Or are you like Peter? Do you really think God can do something dramatic in your life and in your church? Because you know he can. Because if God's in it, we need to be in it as well. At Cornelius' invitation, Peter went to his house and shared the Christian gospel with him and his family and his friends. And as a result, everyone in that home became a Christian. What happened between Peter and Cornelius became the key event in breaking the church out of its Jewish-Palestinian confines. All of a sudden, this is where they thought, we got something, it's going to be confined here, and now with chapter 10, with now Peter going in and giving the word to the Gentiles, and the whole thing, now it's going worldwide. And that's a key. It is now gone worldwide. And there are no limits, none, where this message isn't relevant. I like what Peter said as he was talking to Cornelius. And he said, Peter fairly exploded with this good news. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be any plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and you're ready to do as he says, the door is open. The door is open for anyone who seeks Jesus Christ in their life. Anyone. The complete Christian needs two conversions. Peter's a model of two conversions. The first conversion that Peter went through, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. It was a conversion of personal relationships. It was a conversion of a life of discipleship. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ and live my life for him. I love the second conversion. He recognized that God was concerned not only about him and his little group of disciples, God was concerned about every person in every nation. As we end this series, Thy Kingdom Come, our goal is to build up the church here upon this rock that Jesus established for us, that Jesus is Lord. To seek God's purpose and meaning in our life to study his word, to seek fellowship with each other, to love one another, to have a heart that wants to go out there and seek the lost, to have a goal to say, we're going to fill this building because what we have, we need to share. That's our challenge here in 2019, to show people what God is all about. As we pray here, and we're going to pray here in a second, I want everybody right now just to close your eyes as we prepare to pray and to think that and pray for strength that God will open your eyes to someone who you're thinking, I would like to bring them here to church. Pray that you have the courage to do so, to invite them. And then ask God in all his power to prepare the hearts of the person you're going to ask that they'll be eager to come with you to church so that you'll be, inter be ready to introduce them to God who does amazing things because we serve an awesome God. As the series was, Thy kingdom come, your will be done. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.